So welcome everyone to another episode of Book Club. My name is Mikey Mhenna, and I'm excited to have with us uh, Raphael Cormac, who is the author of Midnight in Cairo, The Divas of Egypt's Roaring Twenties. Uh, Raphael Cormac holds a PhD in Egyptian theater from University of Edinburgh and is and was, sorry, excuse me, a visiting researcher of, at Columbia University in New York. He's an award-winning editor and translator and has written uh, on Arabic culture for the London Review of Books, Prospect, and the TLS, among others. He's the editor of Book of Cairo and co-editor of the Book of Khartoum. He's the author of Midnight in Cairo, which we will be discussing today. Raf, welcome to Africa's Book Club. Hi, yeah, great to be here. Thanks so much for the invite. Can't wait to, can't, can't wait to get stuck in. So let's start with um, a little biographical types of questions. Um, when did you first become interested in Egypt? Um, I, I don't think you grew up there. So no. at what age uh, did you first start thinking to yourself, yeah, I'm really interested in this place? It was, I mean, I actually think probably came to it through a slightly unusual route, uh, which is Sudan. So I, I went to visit Sudan in what it must have been about the winter of 2008 to nine to Khartoum. I was, went with my family there. I really liked it. It was like a, a fascinating place. I was at university at the time. I was doing my BA, actually in classics, which maybe I'll get back to, uh, and had not really had much exposure at all to Arabic culture or, or the Arab world. I mean, growing up in the UK, it, you don't really get exposed to um, sort of the cultural world of the Arab world on a regular basis. You know, I couldn't name that many authors, but uh, or you know, sort of. Of certainly couldn't name any cabaret stars, but uh, but I got really interested in in Khartoum. I got really interested in learning Arabic, and then the only thing to do really at that time, if you want to learn Arabic, was people said go to Cairo or go to Damascus, uh, and I chose Cairo, and then that was in in two thousand and nine, the summer of, and I yeah I just really loved it. it was sort of it's a city that, as I'm sure you know most yeah. of you know really really hits you when you get there and I spent a long time there learning Arabic and then I did a year at the AUC uh, learning Arabic there over the revolution which again was a sort of fantastic time to be there and just got interested in, and then I, I tried to really combine my interest in uh, classical theatre with this new interest in the Arab world so I started working on Arabic adaptations of Greek drama. That's actually I did an MA and then and then a PhD on that subject. And you know, it talked about some of the the greats of 20th century Arabic Egyptian literature. You know, Ta Hussein, who did a version of Oedipus, Tafi Hakim, some yeah. of these big names. Uh, but then, what really drew me to sort of this book was getting involved in that theater scene and researching it, I, I found this sort of parallel world, which was not, you know, not like the very high class Taha Hussein, sort of Tabi Hakim, who, who ended up writing plays that no one went to see. Uh, I mean, he stopped in the mid 20th century producing his plays in the theater because the audiences weren't liking them. There was actually this other like huge popular entertainment scene that I was led into and that's kind of, what formed the the embryo for, for this book. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I feel like there are so many parallels to, I, li I live in Beirut, I'm in London right now uh, uh, on a trip, but I usually live in Beirut and I always see these parallels between, um, you know, um, <laughs> nightlife and, and, and sort of also like Instagram. And um, the perform the performative nature of those venues versus um, the academy, and there's like very two very different forms. Um, yeah. So which is not to say there's not interesting stuff in the academy. Of course. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe now we're seeing a time where, where where some people are trying to kind of bridge these gaps. And I, I mean, Andrew Simon, who's on the call, is you know works on that academically. But just from my experience in Egypt in general, uh, a lot of the people who are doing the most fun kind of work, if you will, I mean, in subjects like this, the nightlife scene, are not really doing it in the academy. They're 
playwrights like Leila Suleiman yeah. uh, and Nancy Munir, who, who's sort of a musician who's doing, doing things and other kind of intellectual circles that are sort of functioning outside the academy. Uh, so as you started working on this book, so this, the nature of the series that we are as book club and the idea is that this conversation can sort of serve as a companion for folks who are either in the middle of reading it or about to read it or who have just read the book. So um, I'm curious, what was the motivation? Um, was the idea of writing the book that exploring uh, this moment in time would help you understand the moment that you were living in 100 years later in Cairo, or do they feel completely disconnected? It was more, it was an attempt, I, I think it was an attempt to really recreate that world of the 20s and 30s, yeah. which, which is, is funnily both very connected to the current Egypt and, and also feels very distant and, and different. Uh, but I think what I was maybe trying to do was look at the kind of nostalgia that was growing up around it, which a, a lot of people were becoming more interested in this period you know, are becoming more interested and, and five years ago were becoming more interested in it and really try and paint as full a picture as possible of really what it was like to actually be there. Try and maybe strip away a little bit of the nostalgia and just kind of see what, if you were a person going to downtown Cairo's nightlife scene, what kind of world you would experience. And then, and, and then it's kind of from there the choice to center on uh, on sort of the women of the scene yeah. emerged because I just felt like, as I, I sort of wrote a little bit in the introduction, I, I felt that uh, it was through their lives that you really get the fullest picture of what was going on and also of some of the, the contradictions yeah. that were alive at that time. So if you were to, to describe, let's say like you ran into like a nephew or a niece of yours, who is like 16 or 17 and sees that this event was like on your Twitter or something like that and says, Hey, Raph, what is this book about? How would you describe it to a teenager? I think, I mean, really what the book is about is uh, these central women's lives. And it's, and so Cairo of the twenties forms the backdrop uh, but I think the this I guess if there's one sentence yeah. as to what it's about, it's how did these new generation of women really focusing in the 1920s and 30s going way back or forth, but let's say that uh, how they lived their lives, how they forged their kind of independence and, and voices for themselves, and how they created this nightlife scene. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's sort of think about um, how the book is structured. Um, so there are three acts, so to speak. Um, uh, it's split up into three parts. The first part sort of sets the scene of the interwar period in Egypt. Um, and then the second part focuses on seven different women. Um, let's talk about the, the first part for a second. Um, if you can, try to set the scene. So what is this? Describe this place, right? Uh, describe this place in Cairo. Um, and what is special about it and what is still true um, or what is no longer true. So if somebody is very familiar with Cairo now, what's no longer true? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a great area and, you know, an area that still holds all of these like slightly fun uh, secret things underneath it. I was, I was in Cairo just last in February, tried walking around, <laughs> reminiscing with uh, some man who was remembering an old bar with a one-eyed barman, sort of like we had a real AMs and man moment. Uh, so it's a great, it's still a great area. But so what I was really looking at is in the really in the mid 19th century, sort of 1860s and onwards, it really starts to become Cairo's modern nightlife district, which starts in like sort of various different levels. So you have the opera house, a very elite theatre mm -hmm. alongside sort of nightclubs catering to a sort of, you know, quote unquote, lower class Egyptian audience, bars, cafes, you know, also hashish dens and whatever you want. And it's a very mixed up area 
in, in lots of different ways, both in terms of class uh, and also in terms of you know, nationality, ethnicity, uh, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. That's by the late 19th century, that's the place where you sort of go for a big night out in Cairo. So that's sort of the real scene setting at the beginning. Uh, but then when the First World War happens, uh, it gets overrun with British soldiers for a while. Uh, it gets sort of totally uh, transformed again. And then in 1919, there's uh, a revolution in Egypt, as I'm sure most people know, uh, to throw off uh, British control, which is eventually and quali in qualified ways successful. So I think what really starts the narrative of this book is that revolution and this sense that a new country is being born uh, and that uh, you know it's a newly independent Egypt. People are asking what that means. And one of the places where that's being played out is on these nightclub stages. And so yeah, that's yeah. sort of the, where we so, start. So these clubs um, are the, I mean, are, are these clubs um, before this period, are there similar type venues in, in other alleyways and other sort of, uh, was there a nightlife that predated this period? The, the, a nightlife that predated the mid 19th century. Yeah. It's hard to find in, in the same way. I mean, okay. in a sense, maybe like this kind of nightlife is a, a product of kind of capitalism. Basically. Sure. The idea that you go to a club and you buy, you know, you buy beer and a markup and you watch a dancer or, or whatever. So clubs that look exactly the same. I mean, I have not found any evidence of them, although clearly entertainment was, was popular and dancers and singers were popular before the 19th century. Uh, they just, as far as I know, as far as I think too, they didn't perform in a kind of setting like this. It'd be much more, for instance, I don't know, at a wedding. Uh, yeah. Would be a dancer and that was common or in, in public kind of, you know, on the streets. In the square or something like that, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's let's move into the actual um, the the choice of the 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 women for a second. So um, you choose these seven these seven women as the the quote unquote leading ladies. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard a talk you give where you introduce this idea of a new celebrity, right? The, like celebrity culture as a primary source and, and the how you research all this different stuff. In the book, you describe these people as being the first generation of the modern Egyptian celebrities. Um, describe what that word means in this in the context of your book and how it might be a departure to from how we think of the word celebrity today. Yeah, I mean, actually, probably it's it's not that different to how we think about the word celebrity today, but in as well as the revolution in 1919, another big development that really happens and gets going in the 1910s and 20s is on the one hand, as, as there's a picture of here, the celebrity press. So magazines started by people, you know, illustrated with these sort of very nice photos in which mostly female uh, stars are talked about, are sort of gossiped about. There are articles on what they're homes are like, uh, you know, there's stuff about who they're getting married to or who they might be getting married to or who yeah. they divorced from. But like uh, the modern, the modern woman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and, and in the in the 1920s, there's, there's a real sense that for the first time as well, these women are sort of everywhere in the public sphere. Uh, and that's also a big, a really big change in, in in the 1920s. I mean, in Egypt, so much is changing in the 1920s. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's one of them. And so one thing that you can do, therefore, is is really get a lot of details of the stories of, of these women's lives from the 1920s in a way that you just couldn't before. I mean, the one precursor who's kind of in this book uh, to all of this is, is a woman called Shafi el Iftiyah. Uh, who uh, about whom a famous movie was made in the 60s and, and people mm -hmm. know her largely through that but who was a big nightclub star in the 1890s and, and early 1900s but who 
we just don't know that much about because there weren't like endless, endless articles about her in the way that there were about Munira Mahdeya or, you know, Fatima Rushdi, Rosal Yusuf, all of these people. But like I say, I mean, it's, it is very similar to how celebrity works now. Yeah. If, in the way that, you know, these women were heavily scrutinized as, as they are now, you know, in the way that male stars weren't. And... Is there, a, is there, was there a hierarchy to celebrity? Like where there's like reality TV star, <laughs> then like TV star, then movie star, then, I mean, it was there a sort of hierarchy to lounge singer, um, you know, I don't know, I mean, public figure? Maybe, I mean, sure, I'm sure some people would draw those hierarchies, you know, that you know, yeah. a politician would maybe rank higher than a lounge singer, but there, it is pretty flexible this time. And one of the fun things I really feel about a lot of the women of this period was how they clearly played around with and manipulated the press. I mean, it's not just the celebrity didn't just happen to them, they also managed to mold their image yeah. a little bit. I mean, the person who does this the most is who's you see on the top right, uh, they're dressed as a, a man, is Munir al Mahdeya, mm -hmm. who is sort of obsessed with planting stories about herself in the press and sending pictures of herself dressed as a man into the press. <laughs> and, you know, has this yeah. lavish houseboat that becomes sort of legendary. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to find her picture. Gets, uh, yeah. There yeah. She is. She was the she was the one who really are they all doing it, but more than any others, she managed to kind of make herself into this huge celebrity in the 1920s. Interestingly, yes. as well, she had started off in the very early 1900s before this kind of she was already the sort of the old star by this point. Yeah. So um let's I want to mention every one of these women uh briefly and Let's start with Rosa Al Yusuf, and I'm curious why she was the first one that you chose in this act. Yeah, I she's the first one, I think, because she's kind of a real archetype of the possibilities that were becoming available to women in this period, and she really seized upon them, and totally uneducated women. So, I mean, her life, her early life is very sort of traumatic. She's actually from, from Tripoli in, in Lebanon. Yeah. She ends up in Alexandria as a very young child. It's unclear exactly why, but she's on her own. And she makes There was like name. a big wave of Lebanese that moved at that period, yeah. right? Yeah, but why but did her family abandon her? Did they sort mm. There's some stories that they also went, they, her family went on to South America. Uh, but anyway, what, for whatever reason, she's there. And she ends up in Cairo as a teenager, becomes an actress has a little bit of, you know, there's, this is in the 1910s and there's a little bit of pushback against whether women sort of should be acting and, mm. and so there's tension, isn't it? But she rides through that and by the 1920s becomes sort of the great prima donna of, uh, of Egyptian theatre, like the big star, the sort of acting star. And then she manages to turn that into her magazine, Rosal Youssef, uh, which she starts she which is my favorite my favorite thing about her that she's like i know the perfect name for this <laughs> magazine <laughs> yeah should be called after me <laughs> but and then she does that and it's usually successful magazine uh and she ends up at the end of her life sort of having lived an extremely difficult life unquestionably but sort of having risen to the top of all these different spheres you know yeah. it's politically influential is literarily influential is she's like the oprah of the 1920s <laughs> yeah Egypt. exactly and she did it from nothing i mean really like no education she was not yeah. certainly not an elite woman by any stretch of the imagination I rem did it surprise you that that women like this were these like multi-hyphenists where they had all these different versions of their careers and they were you know they ran magazines and they were film stars and they was that surprising to you yeah, I, I mean, I just think oh, it's part of the mentality. I think of just doing what you you've got to do. Yeah. yeah so, uh, like the film, people going into film when they would rather not, and and actually, it's it's really a, the early days of film are filled with women in a way that by the 1930s is less true. But most of the early pioneers of Arabic film were women. Aziza Amir, who yeah, the book, but also Bahiga Hafez and. Uh, uh, Asia Daga and um, you know Fatima Rushdie too goes goes into film. 
so may, may, maybe women were sort of able to be a bit more versatile and, and move around a bit more or take more risks. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's... Uh, yeah. Okay, let's keep on going. So uh, Fatma Rashdi. Yeah, so she... And she, I think, is included partly as... So one thing I wanted to do is have different types of, mm -hmm. of women's stories. So you have Rosa Yusuf, who is kind of the, the great, you know, the great hope story. Uh, but I also wanted to have, you know, women who are involved in different aspects of the entertainment business. Uh, so Rosa Yusuf was an actress, then became a sort of magazine editor. Fatima Rushdie is really the great star of the 1920s theatre. Uh, and so it's through her you can tell that story. She was, along with Yusuf Wafi, uh, she was the, there were two main theatre troops, basically in the 1920s, hers and Yusuf Wafi's. Uh, and hers was m just as, if not maybe, if not necessarily more popular, it's you know, hard to say, but certainly just as big. Her life is a little bit more, you know, has more ups and downs than, uh, than Rosal Youssef. She has these quite difficult relationships with men, often I'm sorry, with strange relationships with men too. I mean, her early mentor who, who, who married her, uh, when she was just 16 and he was, you know, in his 30s, maybe even early 40s, um, as Aziz uh, Aid. She, there's obviously like something sort of extremely uncomfortable about that, but within two years, she has left him for another man and, you know, and he and just sort of cast him aside. So she sort of moves very quickly between men, but within these relationships, there there's always sort of an undertone um, well, okay, so I have a question for you, because yeah. in the beginning, you sort of suggested that you had to rely on all these magazines, right? Mm -hmm. How do you not know that they're just like Us Weekly and that these yeah. are just like filled with the ridiculous rumors? So so the, the, the <laughs> magazines are a main source. Uh, another source is, is, is memoirs. Okay. So we do have an equally kind of like not necessarily reliable source. Yeah, but a very different kind of source. Uh, and um, so Fatima Rushdie, she wrote four different sets of memoirs. Mm. So you can rely on that. But yes, the magazines are extremely unreliable. Yeah. You can't ever <laughs> quite say what's going on. I mean, you can get like the kind of basic facts down, I suppose. You know, sure. I, she married Aziz Aid, then she left Aziz Aid for uh, Eli Adrai. Yeah. And then, and then they split up. But exactly what's going on, it's, it's very hard to say. I mean, partly, I think my approach was that these women's lives were as much a performance kind of as their stage shows. Yeah. yeah. So did all of them actually have stage shows? Everyone that you mentioned in this thing? But they, all, they all performed on stage and yeah, different... Kind of different sort of uh, was an actress, but, you know, others were singers yeah um others were dancers yeah. a lot of them were all three you know actress singer and dancer like sure the of me. okay let's go to Ampuzum, who most people would uh be aware of um what surprised you about your research on her because she's somebody who sort of exists very prominently in, yeah. in our imagination already uh what sort of caught you off guard it were i I said before that I, I sort of when I first started writing, I almost thought about not including her. Yeah. Because, you know, she is she's just too big, kind of. I didn't want her to dominate. Uh and and you know, I felt maybe she'd been done a little bit. I mean, this Virginia Danielson has a good book on her already in English. There's lots more books in Arabic. Uh, but what I guess I sort of tried to do is if you put her alongside all of the other women then maybe some sort of slight differences emerge. And I really only looked mostly at her early career, so not, mm -hmm. not the sort of 40s, 50s, 60s stuff. But I ended up actually really liking her after, after, slight, after a little bit of hesita hesitancy, just because of the way, I mean, we say that Munira Matea really kind of embraced her celebrity uh, role by sort of throwing these big parties and being very kind of outrageous. But Um Kalsum handled her career in this totally different way, being very kind of 
didn't give any interviews really to the press or hardly at all. And when she did, they were very kind of cagey. She kept really a, a sort of war around her private life in a way that was very different from all of the other women in the book. I mean, she she was very different from all the other women in the book. I mean, for instance, unlike everyone else, she her father did not die when she was young. So every single other woman in the book, maybe, maybe not Fatima Siri, but you know, Badia Masabni, Fatima Rushdi, Rosa Youssef, uh, Munira Mahdea, they're always their fathers died or left when they were very young. And perhaps part of the reason they got into the entertainment business was wow. because there was nothing else to do and they had to support themselves. Whereas Um Kalsum's father in her early career is a big presence, you know, as people who sort of know a little bit about her early life will know he's sort of very controlling and that's his, um, and you know, when she was young, it was him who took her out to sing and it was him yeah. who got to Cairo. Uh, did you, so, but it sort of surprised you that you started, did you, you said you liked her more. Yeah. Did, do you mean that you liked the idea of including her more or you actually liked her music and her personality and her presence more. I liked her, yeah, it's the latter. I liked the, her presence, her personality and, 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 and such more because she's always sold now as quite a, you know, extremely establishment figure, you know, this person who you sort of can't question. <laughs> yeah. And who represents this kind of, conservative is maybe not exactly the word, but close to sort of this. Yeah, it's like, it's what a singer should be. She represents that, but I don't think, uh, I think her career, in fact, and her life is so much more complicated. Yeah. Did you watch, did you watch that Beatles documentary, uh, Get Back? I didn't, know. I, I felt the same way after watching that uh, about Paul McCartney. Because Paul McCartney is like easy not to like, right? Yeah. <laughs> then I was like, oh, I kind of like, I like this guy more than I thought I would. Like maybe he's a genius. Yeah. And not only is he uh, possibly a genius, which he is, I, I would say, but it's like, I actually like his personality, which I wasn't prepared for. So. Yeah, maybe. and look how serious, like she probably was quite fun. She, she clearly kept up this facade. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these stories about how she loved telling jokes and, yeah. and you see like intimate pictures of her and she's, and she's having fun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's keep on going. So um, uh, we spoke briefly about Munira. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, why exactly she made the cut. Yeah, she, I mean, partly she is really the, the opposite of Um Kalsum. Yeah. That's the way that she, and they were rivals of the 1920s. This is another- uh, Is that overblown or is that true? Uh, I think it's overblown, yeah. I mean, I think that's an example of a story, story that the press like to print. And then of course, as well as the press in the 1920s being quite unreliable, stories then have built up over the decades. Mm -hmm. You know, all the, all the stories about Munir al-Mahdi casting spells on Um Kalsum. And, yeah. And in fact, I think Munir al-Mahdi was probably more concerned with uh, her rivalry with uh, Muhammad Abu Wahab than with Um Kalsum. But, mm. but, but you can see why the story emerges because they're yeah, the yeah. two great stars of uh, of the 1920s in Egypt, and they're so different. So they feel like polar opposites. So. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Um, uh, uh, Aziza. She's I love. She's great. She's, she might be maybe she's my favorite character, although that changes every week in the book. But she is really <laughs> in there. Uh, she's in there because she created Egyptian film, if we want to be extremely and bold about it. She made, quote unquote, the first Egyptian film, uh, other sort of arguably Egyptian films have been made before that. And it's a, it's a fascinating story in which she sort of teamed up with a Turkish uh, impresario, a director, producer, and then they fell out and she left him and took all the rushes from the film and then made it herself in her basement during her honeymoon. Wait, really? Yeah, yeah. She so the story was that so this guy Wadad Orfi, who was Turkish, who had come to Egypt in order to launch the Eastern film business or, or something, you know, launch Eastern quote unquote film. Yeah. Uh, he had teamed up with Aziza Amir and they'd made this 
film about kind of a sort of Bedouin love story uh, crossed with a, a, you know, lots of great Egyptian locales, but in which the main female protagonist's partner runs away with a Brazilian archaeologist's daughter. You know, the, 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 the trope, the standard trope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I've seen it once, I've seen it a thousand times. Exactly. Yeah, well, Brazilian archaeologist's daughter. Um, but then the story is that when they showed the movie to a sort of select group of journalists and friends, she thought it was so terrible that, uh, you know, that she had to do something about it. He sort of, this Winnet Orphy had ruined the film. So she took away all of the, you know, took away lots of the film and said that she reshot a lot of it, although yeah. Winnet Orphy argued with that, and then released it under a new title. And it became, and it was pretty popular. And then for the next few years, kept releasing films. And so this is 1926 that she releases. How cool. Film, which is uh, I mean, pretty early. Yeah. So, and then it's through her, they sort of get into the film business a bit and the role that women played in the film business, which was, as I said before, huge. How cool. Okay, let's keep going. Um, I think Badia is the last one. I think Badia is the last one. Uh, yeah. And tell us a little bit about Badia. She, she. I mean, like a lot of them, she, she really does everything. She's a singer. She's an actress. Yeah. Uh, but she's best known as a dancer and nightclub singer. And I think what she, the what she really did that was very important was again in 1926 she opened up her sala, her like nightclub which uh, on Emmett Dean Street, which was the first kind of, I call in the book this thing, uh, I call it sala, which they were all referred to as that. I mean, literally that just means hall. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's a word that had been used before, but Dima suddenly used a nightclub, but usually it seemed to refer to like cinema halls. So like mm -hmm. usually we have cinema, but she created this thing, sala Fabia, and it was a mix of this kind of European cabaret style entertainment with a more traditional Arabic style of entertainment, largely in the Arabic language and marketed at Arabic speaking uh, Egyptians rather than sort of Europeans, but with some European acts. It was, a, it was a real mix. And actually one of the things I was trying to do with this book is to show uh, cosmopolitanism, that sort of very thorny word, yeah. to show that there was a cosmopolitanism in Cairo, which was Arabic speaking, because in, you know, I think certain Western nostalgic views of Egypt in the early 20th century, there's a kind of Alexandrian European language speaking, I guess, French, maybe of English, cosmopolitanism, which included some Egyptians, but only a sort of certain elite style. What I wanted yeah. to say was that actually there's another kind of cosmopolitanism which included ordinary Egyptians and Medea Masabni's son is, is a great example of that. Yeah. And then after she opened it, you know, loads more of these salas really start up. Yes, yeah. within a few years, there's five or six on around the Medellin Street, all fronted by women actually, although, although probably not all owned by women, but Medea did. Um, so um, when I think of uh, sort of um, nightlife culture in Beirut or in other places that I've lived, it's sort of this like, can be uh, described as this like underbelly of the city where um, everyone sort of like reveals their true nature or in some cases maybe uh, allows their, um, their demons to come out. So is that the case? Was that the case in the in the nineteen twenties in these in this sort of nightlife? Are there, you know, is this sort of like um, a place for for drugs and uh, alcoholism and um, and you know, quote unquote, some of the sort of seedier sides of the city or no? Uh, I mean, yes, definitely. There, there are lots of lots of drugs and alcohol clearly going around. Lots of you know, cocaine and hashish and alcohol and you know late night parties in the yeah, in the way that you expect from a yeah. from a nightclub scene one thing 
again that the focus focusing on on the sort of female stars of the era allows you to do is to look at that in both in two ways you know really also from both sides one is this was a fun time to go out have a nice time in your nightlife yeah uh, you know go out dancing a lot of people had a lot of fun but also there's a there's a kind of danger and you know an underbelly to it all which is if not all certainly contains an element of exploitation and of kind of violence against women and of sexual exploitation as well. I mean, there's a, a line between prostitute and nightclub dancer is, is often thin. Sometimes it exists, sometimes it doesn't exist, sometimes it's thin, you know, and paying for sex is a sort of wide spectrum. And if you have a wealthy boyfriend, who treats you to all kinds of gifts? Is that prostitution or not? I mean, it's a. So um, describe how this period ends. So one one thing I've tried to avoid is to, is to put a very hard ending on it. Sure. Uh, because there's a sense, well, there's a, there's a sense that we can't tell that there's a sort of story of Weimar cabarets, which I think people will think of maybe when they when they think about Cairo cabarets, this sort of exciting cabaret scene that then was put to an end by the Nazis and then finished. So whenever telling a story about these vibrant cabaret scenes, there's always a question of, of what ended it. And then in the Middle East specifically, there's this idea that the 20s and 30s were this golden period. And then after the 50s and sort of real decolonization, all the fun stopped. And that's clearly not true. And I sort of certainly didn't want to uh, portray that. And maybe that's why so Tahir Karaoke, who's in the middle there, sort of serves as this ending, because she starts off in the 30s in Badiama Sabni's nightclub in this scene, becomes an extremely famous dancer and then also film star. But she kind of bridges a gap after the 1950s. So, so in, in 1952, a lot of Esbacare burns down in these anti-British riots mm. uh, in which things like Barclays Bank and like and the officers club in Egypt are targeted, but also cinemas and, and bars are targeted too as kind of symbols of decadence. Um, but, you know, after then, the nightlife scene continues to hair karaoke, for instance, keeps dancing, keeps making movies, but she, uh, unlike the earlier stars, and I'm being a little bit cagey about this, but I think it's true, she is, she's very political. So, I mean, she's very political in the way that she is actively uh, involved in political organizations, Yeah. rather than just so earlier stars had nationalist political views and expressed them on stage and this kind of thing, but to her karaoke, really got involved in political organization. And that sort of felt like a nice, she, she therefore felt like a nice character to shift into the sort of the Nasserist period in the 50s and 60s, which I'm sort of tempted to write a whole other book on. Yeah. So just to sort of convince people that it didn't end with, with that. Yeah. But, but things changed a lot. Things changed a lot in the, um, in the 50s and 60s. So I want to ask one more question before we open up to the questions in the audience. Um, so when people think of, so these characters in the book in, in many ways are, you know, um, uh, depicted as, uh, you know, figures who are expanding the role of sort of like women, definitely in the entertainment industry, but sort of uh, because of their, their prominence sort of, they're part of the discussion of uh, the role women can play in, in society more broadly. Um, but I think when people think about sort of women's movement in Egypt during this period, they don't think of these, these characters. Um, what is the relationship between these women and folks like Hoda Sharawi, Meziede, and some of the other folks, um, um, Adore Shafi and folks like that? Complicated. Yeah, <laughs> so tell, tell me about it. They're all, they're all coming through at this time when, yeah, women, are for the first time becoming very obviously present in the public sphere. And I mean, you go through the magazines of the period 
and and everyone's commenting on it you know and there's pictures of of women entering the public sphere there's there's pushback and there's debate and there's all, all kinds of different things but that's kind of what unites both uh your Hoda Sharawis and your Munira Mahdehs uh, and but there is this tension between on the one hand let's say Hoda Sharawi uh, just because she's the, the big figurehead of this kind of elite feminist movement which is uh, made up of largely educated women with a global kind of reach who go to conferences in Rome and, and in uh, France and what have you speak French and these other women who are on the nightclub stages and are seen as fallen women basically I think Hora Sharari, uh, I mean, I think there's evidence of this too, would would look at these nightclub women and, and, and probably pity them mm. rather than rather than admire them. So one uh, story which I devote a, a whole chapter in the book to is the story of Fatima Siri, who is a nightclub singer who has a relationship with Hora Sharari's son. Uh, and I can't tell the whole full details of the uh, of the story now. I don't know if there is a picture of her in there, sure. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a picture in the book. Um, but so she has a relationship with Hodosh Arawi's son. They have a child. Hodosh Arawi's son does not accept that this is his child or legitimately. Uh, and Fatima Siri has to go to court to prove it, which she eventually does. And throughout Throughout the court case, Fatima Siri is writing contemporaneous memoirs and publishing them in the press, accusing Hoda Sharawi of basically trying to undermine her claims to this child and, you know, not being a, a proper feminist. And it's, I mean, it's it's very difficult. I so said what I wanted to do was say, okay, what if these, let's call, let's say these women were feminists. This is a, and tell the feminist story from their perspective. What does that look like, sort of in comparison to uh, a more elite mainstream feminism that we that we already know, and it, it and it's complicated. I mean, in many ways, yeah. uh, uh, these these women had sort of more freedom than Hoda Sharawi. They could, you know, mm -hmm. they could own their nightclub and sort of do what they want. But in many ways, they're also much more oppressed. In many ways, maybe Hoda Sharawi did more for Egyptian women even if it was a sort of like very cautious route uh, by, you know, promoting educate girls' education and, and what have you. Uh, but maybe women like these served as, as kind of these real powerful role models for people and showing what it could be like to lead an independent life. So I think it's not as simple as they're sort of mean, nasty elite feminists and yeah. sort of the earth, um, nightclub feminists for sure but that's so that that is one part of the story <laughs> i love it okay let's do the quick q a and then we have a couple questions from the chat so what are you reading these days i'm well i'm actually i'm, I'm working on a new book about spiritualism in the arab world hmm. um also sort of, also a 1920s style book which no one really knows how to respond when i say that but um oh. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm but excited. i'm I, uh, so I'm reading stuff around that. Well, one thing which I'm actually reading is uh, not connected to the Arab world in that respect, but there's a, a 1930s palm reader called Charlotte Wolfe, because I sort of got a little bit, was looking yeah. into palm reading. And she wrote these incredible memoirs of being in Weimar Berlin in the 1920s. She was Jewish and she, she had to leave Germany in the 30s. She ended up in England. But in the 20s, she used to go to lesbian nightclubs with Walter Benjamin's wife. She tells all these great stories about the lesbian night because she's also a lesbian. Yeah. At a palm reading. She tells all the stories about buying lesbian nightclubs, which, okay. which is great. I highly recommend. She's got two memoirs. I can't remember what either of them are called, but Charlotte Wolf is her name. Okay. Well, I think that might answer this question. Who would you love to shadow for a day, Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Shadow for a day, Pastor? For... I mean, Munir Al Mate. Okay. Sure. Cool. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Uh, I I think it's uh, that thing that I was talking about with them um, about nostalgia, and that this is not just a nostalgic book for the nineteen twenties and thirties, okay. and this is and uh, and I'm not trying to say that uh, 
the 1950s were terrible and, and yeah we didn't sort of get onto it but like the it's a work that has kind of two audiences built into it a kind of an audience in the Arab world and an audience in the West. I don't necessarily want to split that up entirely, but yeah. sometimes it feels like it. I feel like it's, I feel like there's actually, my sense was that there are three audiences. And mm -hmm. let me, let me, let me make the pitch. There's the audience in the West, right? Um, but the audience in the Arab world, there are those who were, who were like that guy who's reminiscing with you about the one eyed bartender. Yeah. And then there are those who like don't know this history at all, but know the context. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, some it's some people know a, a lot about the uh, story. I, I I talked to Ahmed Negi about it. Mm -hmm. He was like, he knew all the stories, but that's his sort of passion, is that? Yeah, exactly. Um, but some people are sort of like, oh, I didn't even know who Fatma Rushdie was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is this is kind of the whole point of Africa is that they're so many people are like i don't even know what this is you know um and so okay cool i want to ask the last one and then we have three questions in the chat so outside of your profession whose work inspires you uh, right the people who i would love to write like i think i mean the books i've read recently iman marcel's book about inayat azayat is fantastic just the way that she tells because it's a, it's a trouble writing about the arab world at all this you know this idea that so much is sort of lost but there isn't kind of easy archives and, and pay personal papers to to delve into yeah that book she writes like just tells that story so well and uh adina hoffman as well just writes sort of brilliant uh she wrote my happiness uh there's no relation to happiness, a book about Taha Muhammad Ali, the Palestinian poet. Cool. Amazing. Okay, let's get to the questions. The first question comes from Yasmin, who asked me to read her question. Um, why do you think this was uh, why do you think this period was led by female artists rather than men? Wasn't everyone already sick of the wars and in need of this escape? You, I'll, I'll say that as two questions. Yeah. Uh, and in a, in a sense, I mean, there were, there are lots of prominent men in this period too. Uh, Yusuf Wapi for perhaps being the most uh, sort of uh, famous one, but, but lots of others, you know, Mohammed Abdul Wahab. You could tell this story through the lens of, of just popular men. Mm -hmm. I think it would be, I think it would be less. I don't think you'd get as much film. I don't think you certainly wouldn't get as much cabaret out of it it would be perhaps more sort of higher class you could you could tell for instance the story of the of the 1932 arab music conference which was very extremely male so there is this kind of other world of uh, of male stars who are working with it it's funny but when you write things from the perspective of of women or in this period all the men just look so terrible well it's so funny because like as you're even pronouncing the word male you're grimacing <laughs> they just, just you just can't every every woman is just sort of either let down or exploited by all these men and it and actually i used to, i started off writing this book i don't know if anyone's read yusuf wafi's memoirs they're they're really hilarious but he's this to, he's like so egotistical that he sort of claims that he did everything first and that actually this one, and you know, he's, it's all about settling scores, but they're very funny, they're like good, like totally mad. But I thought, oh, Yusuf Wafi has got to be the worst guy in the train. So is everyone hating Yusuf Wafi? He's got to be, yeah, he turns out to be like one of the best. He was a little bit egotistical, but you know, <laughs> so was everyone. That's so funny. Okay, uh -huh. I'm going to ask uh, Andrew's question. Andrew asked me to ask it. He says, thanks so much for the wonderful talk and book. It was a joy to read and teach. I'm wondering if there is a story you wish you could have told in Midnight in Cairo, but did not have the space to, to do so. And when it comes to the book's reception, has anything uh, about it surprised you? The one story, that one sort of angle that I really wanted to pursue, but have not been able to figure out yet is there was this singer in the 19, early 1930s who wrote uh, a book, apparently, 
telling the biographies of all like the really famous singers and dancers of the very early 20th century. I don't think the book was ever actually published, but it was serialized in Sabba magazine in the, in the early 1930s. And so that kind of, that angle of women telling other women's stories is something that sort of lacked a little bit from the book and wish I could have had a bit more of. Because, I mean, in, in the memoirs written by Bhatma Rushdie and, and others, the people need to sort of sell themselves as these unique stars who fought, fought against all odds and kind of triumphed by themselves. That's sort of part of the genre. So they don't really talk about their relationships with other female stars and how that played out. And you get certain hints at it, but it's something I, I found it hard to find. It's, I'm hoping maybe like if I can really track down all of this book written by a female singer yeah. in the thirties, I might tell a little bit more about how women interacted with each other, like female stars. Cool. Um, what about the reaction to the book? What surprised you about the reaction? Um, I, I've been very happy actually with, uh, it seems to have been much more popular in Egypt and, and maybe the Arab world than in, uh, in the West really. And, and I wasn't sure, I mean, like we say, there's like all these different kind of audiences to it. Uh, uh, but the people who have really seem to like it the most have been, you know, in Egypt. And when I went to Egypt, I'm all saying <laughs> how they liked it. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, I hoped that that would happen, but yeah. I'm glad that it did. Cool. So the question is, the next question comes from Giselle. Um, and she, the, it says, um, your book really was a pleasure to read. It really brings uh, to life the nightlife of the 1920s and uh, to the 50s with all the saucy stories and gossip. It definitely puts the life of these strong women in context. Is the book going to be translated into Arabic? And then there is, and the second question is, uh, what was the least expected source of information that you found valuable? Yeah, uh, the, in answer to the first question, yeah, Kutub Khan and Egypt are working on a translation. Hopefully it's coming oh, out. Soon. Great. Uh, done by Aladdin Mahmoud, who's a great translator. And, and I had to actually go through and find all the Arabic originals for all the quotes that I put because I didn't keep a note of them. That took a lot of work. But otherwise, the, the best source of information that I found really valuable actually was this thing in Durham University, uh, and also it's available in AUC now, I think, the old Khadim Abbas Hilmi II, uh, his papers are all there, and they include secret police reports from the 19th century in Esbekeia. And they're quite detailed and have just tell the story of what was going on in nightclubs in the 1890s in Esbekeia written by a secret police officer whose job was was to spy on it. And that's the kind of information that it's really hard to find. And the fact that it survives is great. And it's through there, you know, that we know that Shafiq al-Kiptiya, for instance, was having an affair with the British, uh, like second in command at the police station, and that she was had all the other police officers on, on pay. So kind of a different source of information than just newspapers and memoirs. So really yeah. great. And yeah, if anyone gets the chance, it's it's really fun to go through. So my last question is going to be, how has this informed um, the way you think about current pop stars and current sort of like um, underground performers in Cairo, in Beirut, across the region, um, or in Athens where you're sitting right now? Um, and when you work with students, do you encourage them to actually look at uh, that type of contemporary culture as being as important as folks who are writing, you know, think pieces in um, in the New Yorker or wherever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hundred percent. That kind of, I think that kind of contemporary culture is is great and it's so rich at the moment. The thing, I, I mean, I think the thing that surprised me often, I get asked the question, it's like, oh, uh, what happened? You know, what happened to that time of the twenties and thirties? You know, where's it gone? But actually, the surprising thing is, is really just how similar all of the debates are. I mean, the sort of the problem, perhaps, is you know things have not necessarily 
changed that much since, since the 1920s in so many ways, you know, in whether or not, you know, how prominent female entertainers get treated and how entertainment that's seen as not high class gets treated. I mean, this is something that Andrew, who's on the call, talks about in his, his book of happening in the, you know, from the 50s to the to now almost really. And what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, so I don't know if you remember the story of that song, Andy Zaroof, mm. that was about, I think it happened about five years ago, uh, in which there's a, a, I think she was called Shay Matt, this is a female star who made a video with like slightly naughty, suggestive biting on a banana, basically. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then and they caused this huge dausha. And I think I think the director was arrested and maybe she was arrested too, and then not necessarily charged, or maybe she was. I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but that caused this big scandal. And then actually four years later, I, I read some article, which I haven't checked up to com confirm it, saying that she was later picked up in part of kind of a sex trafficking ring, basically. Oh my God. Uh and that seems to me exactly the kind of story that you might have read in the in the 1920s too. Yeah. Know, one woman causing a scandal by doing, you know, some kind of illicit dance or, or whatever it is. And then and then like I say, this like the porous boundaries between the entertainment business and, and sex work. And like, yeah. Well, um, Raf, thanks so much for doing this and thanks for all of your work and for being cool. willing to uh, share it with us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, everyone, this will show up on our YouTube account and up on our podcast tomorrow. So if you know anyone who may have missed it, who would have loved to watch it, feel free. And I encourage you to share it with your folks and your friends and on social media. Okay, everybody, enjoy your weekend and uh, we'll be here next week.